Hey there, everybody. We're live. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Once again, it's me, my brother, Ben, and we've got Brian after Ben on the cameras. You don't get to see Brian. He's pretty camera shy, and so I don't embarrass him, but he's the guy moving the camera around to make sure that, that we can see all of the painting. So big thank you to those two guys that volunteer their time to make this possible. Give me a shout, Ben. Make sure that I got audio there so I can... Uh, so Yo, I can this is uh, you there, coming Rico. to you from Apollo <laughs> 42 here in the yeah, Nebulon. I like the background. Cool background. Uh, Nebulon sector. Yeah, here. yeah. I got to do another... Uh, I got to do another outer space painting. I yeah, well, you know, cool. uh, things on Earth deteriorated rapidly, so me and some people had to bounce. <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's, good. That's how, yeah, how it totally, is. Yeah. yeah. I like that. We're we're all about imagination here. So I love the backgrounds. Ben always comes up with some fun thing. So it looks like he's uh, wired in from far, far away. Yeah, but they have great reception <laughs> here. So I can get your guys' messages and then <laughs> right down to Joe. He's going to get them all. So you got questions. You can ask Space Age chat. technology. It really is amazing technology. Yeah, you can also send anything you're working on to info at muraljoe.com and he'll have a look. Perfect. Okay. So what we're doing today... Well, you guys light up the chat. Thank you. Thank you. That tells YouTube that this is an important video. So it really is a, a cool and helpful thing when you take the time to comment. <laughs> of course, it did get a little bit hard for Ben last week. So if Yeah, we were in the red on the comment speedometer, man. That thing was flying. That was yeah. a great participation, you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being there. And so Ben, ben will be making sure that uh that we get everything you know i'll be making sure that we don't miss the important uh comments or questions and make sure that yeah right away mavis is asking uh did you paint this from a photo oh hey mavis thanks for being here um uh no this this painting wait a minute paint what from a photo this this picture uh, that we're talking this yeah. right here. are we talking about the one that i'm going to be working on today yeah the leviathan yeah where in the world would I get a photo like that? I just realized. Oh, I just I give you the question. They ask the questions. I give you the question. You had me. You had me with that question. I was about to give you some real serious answer. Well, no, actually, I used my imagination for this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for keeping me on my toes. All right. I need that. Okay. So the you goal. Know, Mary C. Say that your, your right arm looks kind of strange, though, on the Leviathan. The the uh, right the right yeah, yeah your, okay your, yeah your yeah little flipper thingy so there so some context we need some context we do have a little bit of history to show I'm gonna see if I can do it you know just while I'm sitting here I'm gonna see if I can actually go to YouTube because Ben uploaded time lapse video for us to check out of the progress from the last thing that I posted. So I'm opening that now. I'm gonna share my screen in just a moment so that everybody can see it. And so I have to I have to give context here as we're looking, here it is. So this is time-lapse that you're looking at. And so I, I worked and worked on it. I posted the video and a lot was done off camera. So on that flipper, on that flipper there on the left look how it's long right there so if i if i pause this and let's see if we can let's see if we can just inch our way through yeah yeah there get it out of the way look at that long flipper on the left and then i decided well i want this creature so this is where it's valuable all the things that i try to use in my paintings that i try to teach are really about the, these very kinds of moments when i'm trying to control the scene three-dimensionally control what's where, not just rely on luck to come up with a good look. And so as it progressed, I decided I want to move the fin more forward. And so then I moved it more forward. I'm going to, I'm going to zip forward here until we get to that spot. And let's get them we're zooming in right there. We can look at more of this as we progress, but right here, right here's the spot. Okay. Wow. Thank you, YouTube, for making so many crazy things possible. This is pretty cool. So you can see that I decided to change it. I, I put it forward. So then later, if you look over here at camera two right here, uh, 
now the flipper is back sideways again <laughs> so so right here if we zoom in on on this section Dude, right here. you need to make up your mind <laughs> what's going on with this guy's arm yeah well it's trial and error you know you you do a lot or at least i do a lot of trial and error because really this is such a labor of love i'm not about just hoping it lands in the right place and then running with that i'm not about that i i am really very much about deciding what looks best and how can i decide if i don't look at the different options so i in, you so know I, I know you're going for that real moody vibe with this fire breathing thing and all that but the camera is a little dark too it looks like oh yeah we'll right we'll brighten that up a couple notches okay no problem no problem so so the history of this picture you know i uh, to just get up to speed from where it is. We're, I'm going to paint a lot of this right now. And, and if you have questions about this as we go along, just, just tell me because, you know, what I work on on this painting will depend largely on what kind of conversations we get into. But I wanted to show you what the process was up until now. And so if we go back, if we go back here, you know, it, it was the flipper out and i didn't have that big sail on the chain i wanted some action i wanted chaos and by the way we got to talk about the scale technique because that was a great discovery for me i i really was excited about discovering this method for the scales so we'll talk more about that but to do a, a large body covered with scales from head to toe you know and especially to make them look like well organized uh patterned scales like like a lifelike reptile uh or fish you know i that really is a tedious job if you've attempted it so having a speedy technique has been real helpful so i'll show you that as as we progress in this video today so you can see i put the i put the little bones on its chest i wanted the bumps i just did that most of the details on scales are done with a stroke a, a single brush stroke because I because I can't get into making every single scale an art project so I have to rely on the colors to be an object just the color has to be chosen well enough that it looks like light bouncing so I just one little highlight and I got that bumpy belly look and then I came through and I put lines across the belly later turned them in I, I wanted a belly like a threshing sledge because in the description that I followed this this monster is based on the description found at the very end of the book of Job I believe the book of Job spelled like job j-o-b that book has this crazy description of what sounds like a plesiosaur that breathes fire and that if fishermen ever cross it they'll never do it again and I thought wow this would really be a fun thing to illustrate just using the description itself as literally and just looking as deep into it as possible what the author must have intended so that's that's been the fun of this project so that scale technique that's coming together on the chest man i i rearranged it and rearranged it i was just so excited that i could get the three-dimensional shape with lines and then fill it in so now i'm painting over it again <laughs> i painted over it with the flipper and so you know uh i, I got to show you live that technique because it was very fun to just manipulate the shape and and try to get it right where i wanted those lines are powerful for bringing things forward sending things back you can see the perspective that immediately happens when i draw those lines it's kind of like it feels like a 3d modeling computer program almost you know how it puts a grid in a three-dimensional form around an object. Gringle, Gringle is asking, do you take into consideration the texture of the paint mark, like using dry brush or watering the paint down? Oh yeah, for sure. Definitely. I, I do. Look, I'm doing the belly all over again. I did it and there was too many spikes. So I said, I want less spikes. I want them to be more reflect. I, I've done everything in this painting multiple times, every item, every shape. <laughs> <laughs> because because when you you know it's like when you have the tools in your shed and you'll feel like it could be better oh there goes the belly again the belly yeah again. <laughs> again, was, that's, each that's time i got again. that and the, the reason for that is because is because i have a vision of what i'm making i have a vision you know and i'm like i know it can be like this and, and i got closer that time i know what i need to do to get closer the next it's not just guesswork you know so it's the fun 
of getting getting closer and closer what wrong camera there and so you know i i i just i just uh modified the technique each time i redid the belly and finally landed on yes yes that's the look i might have even gotten on the internet and looked at pictures of of crocodile and alligator uh bumpy backs i wanted this the texture you see on the back of a crocodile on the belly of this creature because in the anatomical description as written it says it leaves a trail in the mud like a threshing sledge and if you've ever seen a threshing sledge an old-fashioned threshing sledge has got a bunch of stones lodged in wood that come out just like the spikes on that belly and so it, and so I thought, no, I could totally imagine that. I think that's what they're describing. So, so Mary like, sees convinced your uh, <clears throat> belly scales are, in fact, upside down. Yeah. <laughs> so they're, they're meant to just be something like, like uh, alligator, alligator scales that are not overlapping, but they're just in sex, like tiles, like tiles, and each one has a spike. Oh, we'll see if I can... We'll see if I can fine tune those to Mary's liking. You know, I don't want them to look upside down. So <clears throat> then I decided to put a sail. And so this was fun because I had to use, I had to use uh, everything I understand so far about light shining through and light bouncing off of. So you can see as it develops, I needed the, I needed the sail to, be bulging out where the chain from the anchor is pulling through the middle of it and and it's creating a deep spot so i left the shadow anything that you want to go away be like a valley you can just make it a little shadowed and so then i added light where i want it coming forward and this was a very challenging uh still is I, you know i don't feel like it's finished i probably want to put more uh, of that in the picture somewhere but then deciding the color of that sail, some kind of a canvasy color, and then making areas so the more saturated orange. I always talk about saturated colors. The more saturated colors <clears throat> shine through. I'm just going to bump up the volume of my microphone here so that I can talk a little bit quieter. So the the saturated colors look more like light shining through, and we, we got into that in the last show. And then less saturated colors have more potential to look like reflection on the viewer's side of the object. So I was revolving. So you can see where I made, I'm going to hover my mouse on here. So you can see this right here, that little light spot shining through about, you know, on the right side of my running man's head. The reason that can look like light coming from the other side is because of the saturation level in comparison to the non-saturated surroundings. And, and then also that it has a gradient going into that. So very strategically done. And so here, it hasn't quite hit the mark yet. So as the painting progressed, I worked harder on the gradient going from the, the saturated to the less saturated. So you'll see me keep working that. And then I put the burnt edges. These are burnt edges I'm currently working on right here. And so I just made the gradient from that saturated orange to the black and then put my red and yellow fire colors on the edges. And this was a very technical challenge. Really fun. But, but uh, it, what, what I think, you know, I hope stands out is the, the fun of using studied effects to create something that I'm imagining as I'm imagining. You know, I'm, I'm really just saying, this is how I want it to look. These are the techniques I'm going to use and not, not needing to find a model to paint from. And then I started painting the eye. I painted the eye like 10, 10 times, I think. I painted the eye so many times. And so that's a fun thing uh, to talk about is expressions of faces we get did get into that in painting eyes you can see all the exact same parts and colors of course and from the how to paint eyes video a couple weeks ago and so i used all that exact same technique nothing different and then what i did was uh experimented with placement so so after this whole video is over there uh, still was time I spent 
messing with things some more but this at least shows you what i have on camera so far and so i i relocated the eye again and the reason was because that eye the the location it affects so much of the the mood of the face and i wanted a very particular mood i wanted it to look like a beast that cannot be tamed you that you cannot reason with but at the same time like it has thoughts not so mindless and the wide wide eyes looked somewhat mindless like a viper like a rattlesnake something that is very machine like you know you're never going to change the mind you're never going to reason with a rattlesnake you know you can you can scare it off you can do things but you're, you're never going to like make a deal with it if i do this you <laughs> they, they're, they are creatures of instinct alone yeah uh, at least that's the feeling you get when you look in those in those round unchanging eyes and so david ross says you need to uh, have a series on fire just like you have on water oh i did post a video on this very thing if you look back at any of my videos uh, about leviathan i post one how to paint fire so you could take a look at that if you're interested that one's free and it's on youtube so always... and then uh jay says that sale looks really good it reminds them of rembrandt's sale in the storm on the sea of oh really Bay. oh i gotta check that out cool thank and, you uh, thank uh, you uh, kick, gonna... kick you storm says uh how'd you get the people shadowed without the painting looking wrong and realistic looking thank you so i guess thank you for that I guess, question. Uh, yeah how, how did you get the, the <clears throat> yeah shadows so yeah realistic that, looking? okay so so something that and there i am painting that flipper again we already looked at that so i'll skip forward a little bit we'll we'll get done with this time lapse to get get up to as close as we can to the current condition of this painting that i'm trying to finish so there i am doing the scale technique again trying to make that flipper come forward in the end, it really just did not look like it was possible. Like, it looks like it's broken. It looks like a broken flipper, you know. The, these animals, I, I don't expect, based on the skeletons of the, like, the plesiosaur, I don't expect them to be able to push quite that far forward. And after seeing it, I was confident. I just needed to see it, you know. So then I went back sideways again. I went back to the sideways after I tried that. So we'll kind of... We'll kind of bump forward, see what we've got. We got more scales there. We're working on the lights, soft lights, you know. <clears throat> so, to that question, that question about how'd you get the light and shadow on the people, uh, the same thing applies to the dinosaur. I'm going to call it dinosaur because I based it off of, oh, there's some advertisements for you. Okay, we're not going to do that. <laughs> so, so the, the way that I uh did the the highlights and we should really switch to the painting while i do this because now i can point while i talk so i'm going to move over here and scoop my chair out of the way i'm going to stand while i paint this time and so the power of of a color that is a little bit lighter not a lot lighter as an artist you constantly want to to amplify that you really want it to be awesome and you say wow this highlight is so cool it's so bright and it's very tempting to go brighter than it needs to be so suppressing that contrast is very important really valuable and helpful so the difference between these colors is not much at all and and what that does is it allows me to get light and shadow i think that artists underestimate just how much value is um what am i trying to say just how much three-dimensional form is possible with very limited uh gray scale, brightness scale and so i worked dark so that there's plenty of room you know the darkness of these shadows make it very possible and since you know per our last video since many artists are taught to never use black, which is exactly what I'm putting on this. I'm putting straight black. And since we're, we're taught that, which I disagree with, I, I think using black is one of the, the best things uh, that, one of the most helpful things that <clears throat> I practiced is using pure black because it allows me to get shadows so dark 
that I can put dark colors over them that look like highlights. So now this is that, this color here is that red oxide that I'm using. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Things are switching to that. So this color is the, the red oxide I've, I've used in a lot of a lot of painting, kind of a rusty color. It's a single pigment, it's not a mix, and I just asked for them at the paint store, just like I do a lot of my colors. And so I'm just mixing that with the black to get the skin tone. And so then when I wanted when I wanted the darkness of the shadows, I, I shadows, I used a color like this, where I mixed that with the pure black, and then when I wanted the highlights, so I used light actually uh, any surface that was either facing down or up highlights because I expected moonlight to be bouncing off the water and all of the wet ground. And so I said, well, maybe I should make light on this underside so that it looks like the moonlight. So here's what you do. You just take, you know, I talk about this a lot. We like to use a gray... I like to use a gray violet for highlights. And so the blue, I'm just going to mix this on a separate on a separate palette here. So we'll just put white and red and blue. White, red and blue. And this paint's pretty heavy and working working a little heavier buys me some time to mess with it. So this color is not nearly as brown it's a lot more gray violet so then when i come in and i start doing these highlights you know maybe there's just i, I don't know I, I i never really decided exactly how i wanted to highlight this so we'll just say there's a slight highlight on the rib cage we're going to do the rib cage right here i'm going to reverse it it was lit more on the it was lit more on the undersides of it, but with this character, I actually couldn't decide which one I liked better, so I revolved. Should I do the brighter highlight on the downward-facing surfaces, or should I do the bright light highlight on the forward or the upward? Because everything is just a dark, a dark light. And so I'm going to go like this. I'm going to experiment and see if I like this better. So now we're paint painting the top of the rib cage right here with the much grayer tone and you can see this color is like a gray gray violet i use red and blue and then we'll go across here we've got that and then we'll just have now this color is hardly different they're all dark colors okay now the first set of muscles on a belly is maybe about that high so we're going to go like this and we're going to keep it just a little darker than the ribs that difference is, well, I mean, we're splitting hairs here, but the exciting thing is that it gets seen. And so you can make this a little bit darker, just a little bit. These are the two muscles right there. And then there's going to be, let's make them a little bit longer. They're stretched because the torso of this character is really stretching out, trying to get some speed. And then we're going to put this second set of abdomen muscles is going to be a little bit brighter as it goes down lower. I'll borrow some of this dark color so that it's more of a gradual change. The reason for that is that the belly, I want to suck in up there under the top of the rib cage, but then it flattens out. Therefore, if my upward facing surfaces are going to be established to be brighter, look at, look at the concave of the belly that creates. Like these ribs are really like, he's breathing, he's breathing hard. And that, that adds a mood of moving and sprinting to this form. And it's not, you know, it's not just a diagram of the muscles. So I, so I really want to decide. So I, I actually do like that better. I like darker on the downward facing. It wasn't like that before I put this paint on just now. I had, I had highlights on the downward and upward, and I kind of lost the concave of the belly. So then here I just made a... I didn't put a lot of science into it. I just said, well, one of these one of these two pectoral muscles I want to be brighter than the other. Like maybe there's more light for some reason over there on the left side. So I put the three main sections of these chest muscles, one, two, three, like this, with my slightly, slightly lighter color that I'm calling a highlight, but it's such a dark color. You know, it's just a little bit, just a little bit lighter than... The color it's going on top of and do you change how warm the highlight is 
based on whether it comes from direct uh, like fire versus reflected light. Like Absolutely. Moon, yeah, um, yeah. And so you can see that. Yeah, I definitely do. That one's from uh, Jay Mitchell. He's he's asking. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, <clears throat> hey, Jay. How's it going? Thank you for watching and asking that question. I appreciate that. And so, uh, so I definitely consider what lights, but it's not just which light it's facing. It's what lights is it facing? Because it always needs to be if if i want this image to be as believable as possible then the end goal is that every surface has the average of the lights average color of all the colors of lights that are facing it and so this one i did not put a lot of orange because hardly any of this is facing the fire but then up on the shoulder look how much more of a pink color so the reason I chose that pinkish violet is because I'm I'm running out of my my dark color is starting to dry so so my it's not mixing as much it's going on a little bit lighter now because it's not mixing with the dark so that means time to stop on that so I can always come back and do it again so I like that softer feel I just now came in and made those muscles stretching from the chest a, a little bit of a softer transition so then this one is pulled back again i want that to also not have a lot of the orange but then when i get up there on the shoulder i'll just kind of put these in real quick because the paint is a little bit too dry to manipulate and blend now so i have to just come back to that and do it at a time when just reapply the paint that's all i ever do just reapply it blend again do the parts that i didn't get to quick enough but kick you storm is saying that their shadows always end up too blue or purple which is what makes them look uh makes them look wrong okay it? okay yeah and that totally makes sense but but uh once you see that here's here's my question once you see that why not just make them less blue or purple why not just i mean i don't want to be annoying by saying that but maybe there is some teaching or habit or some reason that you always feel like you need them to be so purple but if it doesn't look right, trust your instincts. You don't have to keep doing it. Yeah, I so, mean, maybe you just need uh, orange and purple. Or you need, uh, okay, you know, okay. blue and teal is a very uh, common cinematic color grade, too. You know, you could go blue. Uh, there you go, yeah. Sh uh, shade and orange highlight. And it it's could be this, you popular know. Popular aesthetic. Okay, okay. So we've talked about working from a mid-tone. So, for example, that what Ben you just said the the yeah, teal and orange yeah that that uh is a very fun color contrast but without a mid-tone it can definitely lose its magic on light and shadow so here i've mixed a violet that's heavier on the red because orange light mixed with the soft blue of the sky does not make what paint makes if i do blue and orange with paint it just gets gray but with light, it turns into more of a purple color. So that's why I mixed this color. So all of my, all of my highlights are based on an understanding of the expected results of light mixing. So here is my more pink color. Now here's what I'm going to do with this shoulder. I'm going to put more of this, more of this fire blaze color right on the end of it. So I'm going to go in here and rinse that out in my water and I'll get a bright color now so that color probably I can just make with white and with this red oxide right here probably just this right here will be enough you know what I'm gonna do a sit on my stool give me a second to grab my stool I think I'll work better if I am not leaning over sideways here don't don't let me block the painting Brian you just holler at me if I block it. and so here this is that same red oxide. You can see you can see that it looks kind of kind of pink on this palette. And then when I go here, it's probably not going to look very pink anymore because it's next to a pink purple. So let's go like this. Let's go like this. That's the trapezoid muscle going down to the collarbone, going up to the shoulder. I'm just resting my shaky hand on the canvas so that I can get a nice clean edge. And this is how I finish paintings is by going to those edges and just make making the edges clean if you get the edges clean in a painting 
you need not worry about the details inside those edges. Look, look at the difference that sharp edge makes. And so you go, you know, uh, sometimes I'll get compliments on so many details in a picture that I really did not spend, a, I did spend a long time on details in this picture. But many times I'll go really rough on the details and then I'll just go really slow on edges like that. And then all of a sudden uh, it, gets, it gets more credit than it deserves for being a, a detail piece, you know. And it's actually not much of a detail piece. Here I can put the light, you know, we can separate these muscles. Zoop, like that. Now we got, you know, we've got the separation of the neck and that must stretch now as he puts Separate this. those muscles, man. Zoop, zoop. <laughs> Get in there. So here, it's a notice that I don't have this bright highlight uh, as much on this side because I'm imagining the fire on the other side. So I'm I'm thinking about where it's getting blocked. So I left I left a spot not highlighted with that real bright color. So you can get real carried away with with a fun color like this. You're like, oh yeah, that works. That's like magic. That makes my picture come to life. And then you do it everywhere. Oh, and then it's not a highlight. But yeah, Don on says it. you're amazing. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Okay. You know, uh, Mavis also says, I noticed that the color I mix on my palette looks really different on the canvas. How Good you, observation. How do you compensate for that? Or oh, it, well, anticipate the change. Yeah, well, everything doesn't have to be through anticipation. You can do trial and error. It still tricks me all the time. I'll, I'll make a color and I think it's right. And then I go to the canvas and I, you know, just like this, I can say, oh man, that's a lot more orange than I thought it was going to You know, I'll just go back and adjust. Definitely get better at predicting the more you do it. You know, I'd say that's to be expected. But, uh, you know, I, I, I just use trial and error. And, and so having the tools to go through the trial and error process, I think is the, what is valuable. So, what else am I going to do on this on this picture? You know, I I'm slaving away on this arm. I'm doing that. I'm gonna I'm gonna do one little one little blend on that shoulder because I feel like that shadow hangs over a little bit a little bit much. So, I'm gonna go like this. I'm gonna create my dark color. This is my red oxide and my black. I'm gonna put this color on here. I have to like flex the muscles in my left arm to keep that hand from. It's like the harder I think about my right hand, the more this left one starts jittering on me. Okay, so we're going to go like this. And then I'm going to start adding white to that. That That is the rusty color and black. And so I'm going to try to do a complex gradient right here. And I'm going to make it go from that, what I want to look like a skin tone, that is not facing the fire. So, so we're doing the black on there. I'm going to do a little bit more. I'm just going to put my put my palette down now that you know what colors I'm using. That's pure black right there. And what I'm going to do is put that right up here where the concave is. We'll get lighter and lighter, but as we get lighter, we're also going to get more purple. So we'll put blue, and then we'll put red. And you can just pre-mix. This, this whole process is way easier if you just pre-mix colors. But because I'm going to bounce around like crazy on different content uh, on, in this picture, for that reason, I'm not going to pre-mix colors because I'd be pre-mixing for the entire show. And we all know what that's like. So mm -hmm. fun. So yeah. fun. <laughs> I got a little Watching bit. Joe pre-mix colors is one of the yeah. few joys that I have in this life. <laughs> Mm, it's like <laughs> we went a little truffle, bit, a uh, little bit long on the premixing on that. How to paint clouds? Truffle and, fries and uh, yeah. What else? What else paints. do you need in life? Yeah, yeah, right. It's just so amazing. Yeah. So we don't want to do that. I'm I'm mixing my last little bit of light purple color here to put right here, right in there. Zoop like this make that muscle stretch and across like this and leave a little bit of a concave so we'll make a gradient going into that because we need that concave where the shoulder meets i've got all these muscles memorized now i don't have them perfectly memorized but i'm relying what i'm trying to say is i'm relying on memory in order to quickly accomplish my goal because 
In a painting like this, it takes all the fun out when you, uh, with every little brush stroke, are trying to figure out if it's done in the right place. And so having a lot of things memorized makes it a much more pleasant experience. So right. So you here, can take five from that painting if you want to come over here and see what Sean uh, Gilliard has no. been painting. He's also got himself a little monster and some water. Nice. Let's check it out. Give me a second to and wrap he, up the stroke. Humans. Okay, cool. Here, let me rinse out my brush and take a look. Yeah, so we'll move on. When I come back, we'll move on and do some other stuff. But that's how I get the dark three-dimensional highlight and shadow. I'm still working from mid-tone to highlight, mid-tone to shadow. That rusty color was would be categorized as my mid-tone. And then, you know, as you saw the highlights, uh, we can use small differences to get great, great three-dimensional perception. Oh, wow, that is cool. I like that. I like that picture. Yeah, nice we got a, work. The thing Very out cool. there and... Yep. Tip my computer up a little bit and look at that. This is uh, Pokemon inspired. Now that sure. looks like maybe. Now that looks like me. I'm gonna try to guess your medium that you worked on here. This this looks like either you uh, maybe created this on a tablet digitally or on a screen digitally, or you yeah, used okay. a, a airbrush. Both of which I am a big fan. I'm a big fan of those mediums. They're so fun. You get you can get some softness in your blending. That's awesome. Man, I love your turquoise water, your reflection color, very dynamic, and the little character. I got to say, that little character in the bottom left, that really does it for me. The, it, yeah, we, it creates perception of giantness. You know, you see him looking out at the big sea, sea creature, the big cliff. Yeah. Good scale. Good scale trick, putting that little character in there. So then Beautiful. we've also got... We've also got this other one here, a uh, uh, lovely water painting from uh, uh, Leanne Triple. She's out there today. Oh, nice. Uh, okay. Oh, look at that. Nice. Nice. Good job, Leanne. Now, I'm going to take a wild guess here. Just because of my experience posting photos of my waves, I noticed that the greens come out greener. Tell me if you agree that your photo the greens are greener than they look on the real painting. That is an issue with digital media, you know. And so uh, when you're working with the photo, you can manipulate that. and change. But when you take a picture of a painting, you feel like your hands are tied sometimes. So, so I really think you did an awesome job. In conclusion, I think this blue to green looks fantastic. I love the perspective of your curl. That is so smooth and consistent. That consistency is so important on water. You know, consistency is different than perfect placement. Consistency is, is a fluid surface all moving together. And so when you have waves that do a little bit, brush strokes that do a little bit too much crisscrossing, you can lose that effect. So you did a great job of maintaining that, that flowing surface right there. Very cool. Love the, love the gradient, love the beach, the foam. Thanks for sharing that. So we're going to do this next. We're going to go to, we're going to go to water on, on this one because I need more chaos in my picture. So we'll spend some time doing the... Mm, don't we all? <clears throat> don't we all just need a little more chaos? Yeah, yeah we just need a little, a little yeah, bit more chaos. That's something I can really sympathize with. And so uh, this is a fun, a fun opportunity to talk about, you know, I'm going to switch to maybe a little bigger brush. I've realized after toying around with different brushes, I really do favor the angled brush. I really do like that better because the angled brush lets me do uh, brush stroke shapes. You know, I, I, I tried doing waves with that square brush in the, in the last one. By the way, that last picture, that last painting from last week's live stream, I did a part two. And the part two is not live, but it was for the purpose of creating a full length walkthrough, the, the real time explanation of how to do that oil painting. I thought, hey, this painting is worth is worth doing um, completing, worth completing. And so I documented the whole thing, made another video. It's going to be up at muraljoe.com. Okay, so I'm going to put turquoise on here, just like just like. Uh, 
the end just like she did here's the blue but the difference with this is i need to make sure i use lots of black because and that was something i actually learned this is pretty new to me is the importance of black and even what i want to look like illuminated water a lot of the time because that was what i needed in order to make those whites in the oil painting pop i just couldn't get the whites bright enough which many of you have experienced if you tried oil painting you find yourself frustrated and at a loss for how to get the bright highlights you're after and it's much easier to just stop fighting that battle and just make the darks darker instead and then all you have to do is shine a brighter light on your picture and it just pops it looks awesome when you do that you know you just create the you just create the difference that's what the main goal that the main concern is creating the difference because the brightness of the light in the room can create the overall lightness of the picture it's a painting it's not a computer screen so you're relying on the lights that are shining on it to create the brightness so so don't don't fall for the for the trap of trying to get your highlights bright enough you know when it's not happening easily so there's my gradient all of those colors are dark uh, on us on a scale of how how dark or light they could be they're all dark and so now i'm going to use magenta watch this i'm just using magenta jay's out there laughing because he was at the workshop where i where i uh talked about magenta so much i was like well you got to use magenta why are these colors looking wrong well you got to use magenta how do you get a good gradient well let's put magenta right here it's funny so then in people who know you call you magenta joe magenta <laughs> they said so in conclusion really you can sum it up with one word magenta <laughs> so yeah. i really do use it that much so the reason i'm using it here is because when that magenta hits this green it creates just just the right shade of this gray violet that i want to look like the subtle mix of the orange light with the skylight you know we got this orange glow we got this and so this mix is all from the magenta hitting the thalo green it's magenta and green to get that nice gray reflection color so i just put some of that on there and then i've got my rising rising wave right there and i i can come back and do this a hundred times in a row until i get the wave shape that i'm really after but let's not do that right let's not do it a hundred times now what i'm going to do is make this go like shoot up here who knows why who knows what might have been in this water a half second to go because this is like a fast moving chaotic scene what i need to do is just create the chaos and make it believable and then the imagination can fill in the blank so what i'm going to do is just make a wave shooting up right here now edges that's an important thing in picture so i can overlap a certain amount so i'm on this arm of this this uh character and and you know you can be real careful not to obstruct the edges you work so hard on or you can just know that all it takes is a few strokes like on that guy and it's okay to overlap them a little bit because when you overlap them uh you're, you're just going to come back and redo only those edges you don't have to come back and redo gradients and details you don't have to do a lot so now watch this i'm going to put white in here and we'll we'll take you know maybe i can get a messier brush it, it might be cool if i get this brush is an older brush that's that's kind of messed up on the end see the see the end of that and so if i just grab white and go like this i can get a lot of those little don't even worry about that chain so we're going to go like this we'll put little spots everywhere light touches heavy touches and i'll turn the brush different directions so when you use a textured brush you always have to be mindful that it can create too much repeating pattern so you got to vary your contact your angle your you know vary as many things as you can make it as vary as many variables i was trying not mm, to say that but it I know exactly what you mean <laughs> vary as many variables yeah <laughs> hey if you guys have any specific questions about any part of this painting we're doing it live so that you can get them to joe so feel free to put them in the chat and uh we'll uh, attack That's that it. issue okay very good and so now i've got that so see how this looks eh, it's just all right so what i do then after i've got my fine texture now i can come in and obstruct 
the areas that look overly predictable. And at the same time, I'll throw in some magenta to create the shadows I'm looking for in the white. Well, that's how all these this shadowed white water is created. I do that so that this looks like foam and it attaches you know, it, it makes it makes like the uh, just just the right kind of believable connection with the water when you mix that in and you get this kind of purple color. So this is Leanne says you know, you've got so much movement in that water. It's fantastic. Thank you so much, Leanne. That's very nice to hear. That's the goal here is movement. And it's, if you perceive movement, then imagination can go all over the place. With that You know, imagination is is the most powerful tool to use. It's the things you don't paint that are the most fascinating. You know, that wherever the imagination wanders to, because of what you painted, that's what that's what I'm interested in, is where where you can send the imagination running off to. Oh, yeah, maybe a maybe a broken piece, maybe the chain hit the water, bounced up, and now it's tugging it up. Who knows? I don't know what happened here, but if I just make this splash, believable. So now I'm taking the dark color. I'm not just randomly putting colors. I'm going to my biggest light areas. Maybe those are areas where there's more water visible, less of the foam visible. So wherever I put that color in the middle of white, that's going to cause the look just like we did with the waves. So I, I use that all the time when I'm doing splashes as well. So whenever I do these darker colors, it creates more transparent blobs of water. And then again, it can cause my splashing to look more natural, you know. And, and so then it's always, it's always just kind of a, a back and forth dance, trying to get everything to be just what, just what I'm, you know, I, I don't know, sometimes I just go trial and error. I don't always just think, oh, this is what I want it to look like. Let's go. Sometimes I do just put the water together and just see what happens. And then if I if I like it, I keep it. If I don't, I redo it. You know, Michelle is asking, do you clean your brush? Because their mixes are getting muddy. Yes, I do. I have a big bucket of water here. Brian can switch over and show you the materials that I've got. I got a big bucket of water. And yeah, I just stick the brush in there, swish it around. And I'm working out of cans. When I dip in the paint, it's just barely a little. It's the corner of the brush when I'm working on details like this, you know. So I, I totally I totally relate to the, the muddy brush, you know. Uh, with time, repetition, I, I do feel like there is a skill of, of brush, of maintaining brush shape, just the, the presence of mind. Uh, increases uh, of how how much that brush is shaped like a little chisel so at every moment really while I'm painting I'm I'm thinking about the shape of the brush and if I need to take a minute to to correct it because uh, that is an issue you are you are not off base in experiencing the need for that brush to be a good shape you know I I completely rely on the nice sharp shape of my brush so that when I when I go through and I do little details like this you know I I want this to look like the front edge of water I want to actually create water that's coming out the front edge is kind of beating up like it does so this tiny little line is only possible if I find a place on my brush that can do it you know Kick so, you asks is there a time when a brush should be retired <laughs> yeah Definitely, I I definitely uh, I I put brushes in in like the uh, no longer use box. I'm like, well, maybe someday I'll use that for something. <laughs> you know, well, I pulled this. Usually, one. about that time, you turn like a, a stuffed animal into your next brush, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, experiments are good. You know, I love experiments. Okay. When you, so, uh, when you create, do you feel like you are excavating the ideas? David Ross is asking, like oh, digging question. your way to satisfaction with the picture. Uh, that's, I mean, I, I feel like that's, a, I never really would have put it into those words on my own. But when I think about it, that is not a bad metaphor. You know, it's kind of like the sculpt, sculptor that said, I just cut away the pieces that don't look right. You know, you you are, it is the, you know, that maybe makes it more deep than it needs to be, but it is the trial and error process 
So this right here, I want this to look like just foam. And I was just thinking, oh yeah, I want this to be real splashy. This is coming up. And so I just use blue and magenta on this one so that it doesn't have any of that turquoise water color in it. Maybe it looks like just some of the white water kind of catching the light there. And then I'll use my, use my junk brush and maybe I can Maybe I can obstruct that a little bit here. Let's get the brush kind of messed up. Get those, get those tiny little ends on there. Let's go. Just use it. That's what I like about this water base paint is it dries and then it's like just very durable. You can abuse it quite a lot. Let's put tiny little speckles here to soften some of my giant shapes because giant shapes don't look. The, they mess with the scale. The problem it creates is a is the problem of scale. I need this to all have a, a big scale. These are big splashes being seen from far. So if I have only big water beads, something to really be conscious of is the scale you're creating by the number of your shapes. And so the more I come in here and make these tiny shapes, and a fun way to do that too, I'll have you, uh, I'll have you zoom way in, Brian, for this, see that this is what I'm talking about. I'm changing the subject right now. I'm sorry, I, I got distracted and saw it. It's just now starting to look like something I didn't expect because I just I'm looking at shapes I like. It's just trial and error. There's no no real big science to it. It's just having the tools I need to manipulate what I see. And so this is definitely a combo between knowledge of what and then just trial and error to see what shapes are cool. So. So here, when at the moment this merged and I got these together, all of a sudden this is kind of all one motion that I don't really understand, but it's starting to resemble believability. And, and I just love that. I think that's really cool. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. Water. Here's a trick you can do. It's not that much. It's not that great of a trick, really. We're just going to use water and white paint, and we're going to flick it. This is very watery, but when these shapes are real tiny, they're not going to drip down the canvas. So, so let's do it like in this area. Let's get a lot of drips that are just coming out of here. See that? Like that. It's just like a toothbrush, you know? Well, if you're that kind of a person that flicks the toothbrush water on your brother or sister. There we go. See, you know, I don't want to go too far. It's a very fun technique. You can go too far real fast with that. But look how it softens everything. Just And that's just pointing it out there, getting the right amount of water. It's not going to drip because it's just so tiny. The beads are so tiny. So like, it did bounce and hit my face. I've got a few drops on my face at the moment. <laughs> Kiku's asking, uh, do you have a large folder of ideas or an overfilled digital storage uh, I, no i no i just i just have uh, an obsession with savoring real time observations you know i i look at a sunset and i say i when i see something i haven't seen i just stop in my tracks and i say i'm going to i got to figure out what i'm looking at cuz i'm going to use that someday in a painting and after I did that enough times, it got to the point, it got to this point, it got to this point here where, where, I can, where I can create from imagination something more believable because I've got the pieces that I need. I've got the, the, the things, things that I can manipulate, move, move the dials left and right, so to speak, in order to get that. Okay, there we go. So I've got the color. In the transparent water, I've got the foam where there's no, it's just too broken up. It's all just white water. And the, uh, those two things together, I just love the look of, you know. But I might want to go a little bit more on the, I might try to do a little bit softer blending. I kind of like just filling it in there. That, was, that wasn't a bad thing, you know. I look at the tiny stuff. I, I like the look of that. Okay, let's do another wave. Let's do another one, like back in here, because I want this really just going everywhere. I kind of like how the chain is now in the water. I was going to redo it. Here's how I did the chain. Watch, I'll show you a fun little thing. You know, before you, you get a on picture? the chain, you got uh, a picture to look at there. You wanna... Let's check it out. I heard the uh, I heard the uh, tone on the. I heard the. You've been you've been summoned with the, <laughs> yeah. uh, the dragon my, beam. Dragging my stool. Yeah. yeah. So I got this it. one. Uh, what is this one came. Yeah, this is Sweet. like uh, 
Oh, the, love the, the color. color. Yeah, so you were just talking about the turquoise orange dynamic yeah, right. contrast. So Look at that. This one is from Carlos Osin. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Nice job, uh, Carlos. I love the purple next to the orange. This right here is a, it's a. They're trying, they're watching your dramatic clouds class. Nice they're job. Okay, to, uh, okay. So I love this purple that you're going down into. I love your gradient going up into the brighter colors very nice work keep having faith that this is on the right track because you can look at this you know you've got dark edges here that are darker than you would expect to see on clouds just just keep plugging away as soon as those edges get lighter and you and you've got like this more purpley reflection around those this is coming along beautifully it really is well, you know up. uh this leads me to leanne's question here she says have you ever experimented like with abstract or impressionistic paintings you know like this one from carlos looks kind of abstract yeah it does have that feel the heavy yeah and it's highly stylized because it's a cool look you know honestly i think that last week's oil painting was the furthest i've gone into that world and it wasn't it wasn't very much like that but it is so fun you know trying to take awesome painting thanks for sharing that trying to take what uh i think now that i've spent so much time looking into how to copy things as i as i uh, immediately see them you know trying to just copy all the parts and making it lifelike photographic however you want to say it has given me so so many um uh dials to turn like i was saying earlier so much more understanding i think it, it would just be so fun now to try to use that that exact knowledge you know to uh, do something more abstract but strategically abstract or you're going to make you know just a couple strokes of something fully intending it to look like such and such you know i think that'd be fun so the chain all, all i did you make a circle, you make a line, you make a circle, you make a line. That's what you do. So here's a circle, here's a line. And you can just do a, if you want to do it, chains will twist and turn. They're not always just the circle and the line, you know, so let's do this. And, um, you know, sometimes you do, as the chain twists, you'll get flat and circle. You do oval next to an oval next to an oval because they're just turned like so and they can be equal. But once you get that, all you do is come in with the highlight color. I'm gonna get a. I'm. I'm gonna. I'm gonna boost up some of these dark colors to get this chain to pop pop forward again a little bit. There now it looks like it's really coming out of that water. So now I'm gonna get a light. You'll guess the color. Light gray violet. That's it. And I'm gonna get this and just make the highlights on that chain we're just going to go like this we're going to go line at the top right there line at the top right there line at the top right through this middle one like that and and look how that chain just immediately but these highlights are not bright so you can very quickly go so bright on these that it really kind of uh, uh well it, it looks it looks less natural you know it just ends up looking less natural so so in order to get that and this is what we were talking about earlier with all the dark colors that are on the people being able to do the whole form with just dark colors the shadow and the highlight with dark colors so i'm taking this light gray well i'm in this color i'm thinking oh i should just go around those edges and clean them up i'm grabbing a little bit of black because i want to go further into this link like that just in case eyes really go into there and look you know they'll be like man that chain is legit <laughs> Let's go like this. Pure black right there. Because why not? Why would I need any color on this middle part of the anchor? I just want that thing to pop and really come forward. So I'm just going to go right here. On the darkest part, there's no need for any color information right here. No need. I don't need it. So I'm just using pure black. And that's going to help that anchor to just jump forward and create depth. In my picture just like i'm going to use pure black wherever my very darkest i have to reserve black for my darkest shadows so you know uh for example when i get over i don't i don't want to go off camera so maybe here you know on this character i'm going to use pure black just in the corners of the mouth watch this watch this pure black right there pure black right here but not in the middle because maybe i want it to look like if someone looks close enough maybe i want them to see a tongue or 
something inside. So see how I put black on the corners, but then maybe there's like a tongue visible in there. Uh, no harm in putting pure black like, you know, uh, where else could I put that? Where's a spot that's not facing toward, you know, it really isn't facing toward anything. Oh, right here in the groin. This is a great spot where the sun doesn't shine, right? This is what they call that spot here. That's a well, great place. Before you talk about legs. that anymore, I'm going to change the subject real quick. Uh, Don't worry. I won't go too far, man. I'm the tourist. <laughs> I don't know. I'm well, you know, uh, Paige is looking for your thoughts on a specific product here, a thinner for oils called Neo Mega. Never used it or heard of it? Have any thoughts on it? Oh, uh, when you're talking about thinners, uh, I, I am so unknowledgeable about thinners, but here, here's what I do know is that that is a chemical engineering medium an oil painting medium yeah yeah no i got it. yeah so a lot of people will use different mediums people will use mediums to um to get different techniques and i, I think that's awesome that's a great thing to use mediums as for the specifics of which ones are good to use i try to steer away from from that use your own i i have to you know i have to just back away from answering and, and just say use your own judgment on those because i was about to say that's a market of chemical engineering that's con constantly it's a competitive world constantly being engineered changed and there are older things that many people still use and practice there are newer things that people are trying to introduce but what it all has come down to for me is knowledge of the subject and so you can explain to me how to use those mediums when you when you get it figured out because honestly i'm just not that knowledgeable about it but but my only you know my only comment is uh freely experiment with them and don't don't see those as the pathway to having having the paintings that you're looking for you know but i could be wrong it's just my opinion well, apparently I butchered the name anyways, so if you haven't heard of it. Oh, it's not. <laughs> She's like, that is not how you say. Oh, man, sorry. I got, sorry. I, got like an, I got like an LOL with like five L's yeah. on both sides. Well, it would have been even worse if I would have tried to pretend like, I, oh, yeah, I know what that is. That would have been awful. <laughs> After you say it completely. Oh, uh, yeah, Megal. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it said stuff I put on my Cheerios. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, I totally know what that is, yeah. No, I, I just pulled out. The, I was doing an oil painting with waves last week, and, and I was thinking, oh, man, it'd be nice if I could thin this paint because I was trying to do an effect where I need the paint to be a little thinner. I can't remember what it was. Yeah, feel free to drop your <laughs> personal recommendations for mediums and thinners in the chat over here. I'm sure people yeah. in the room would love to see what's working for everybody I, else out there. I'm always open to that. Yeah, with water base, uh, I have used Modern Masters has, has a cool medium for water base. I have a lot more experience with water-based stuff. They they have their tintable glaze, and uh, it, it used to be called Scumble. They put that on their S S C U M B L. I don't know if they still call it that, but but it is the water-based tintable glaze, uh, transparent base, and that stuff's pretty awesome, man. I would just put a little bit of it in paint like this, and it really would buy me some mixing time. But my caution. My caution with any medium that gives you thinner paint and more mix time is that it also changes the way it dries. And so manufacturers or the way it handles, maybe manufacturers will say otherwise. Maybe they're right. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm just telling you what the experience has been for me. That uh, when, you, when you change the consistency of the paint, then you can... You can sometimes change the smoothness of how it how it's going to blend with other paint the handle ability when you try to do real smooth gradients sometimes you can find that the uh, thinning of the paint and buying yourself more time it definitely makes it stay wet but you find it like skipping across the canvas leaving extra thin spots that are hard to patch up so it's hard to explain you know but I, I have leaned toward just knowing exactly what I'm going to do in a small enough space that I know I can do it. Just like on this wave right now, I'm keeping it small enough that I know I can get to the reflection part before it dries, rather than trying to use a medium. Not because it's a better way, but it's the way that I've found to 
to uh, give me the results I'm looking for more often. So I'm going to go in here, real dark water, just real dark. What's interesting here is the paint that I used for a daytime scene of waves lighting up in the sun are the same colors I'm using now for a nighttime scene of waves barely lighting up in the moonlight, keeping it real dark. So that's interesting to me that the difference is hardly any difference at all. It's just context of the other colors that it's surrounded by that changes. Okay, here's my magenta and white. I'm going to make this pink, pink color right here. Sometimes you can just, uh, uh, for, for a messier look, I'll just go straight on it with magenta like this. I'll just go like this. Just magenta, not mixed with white here. Let me try again. Here's just magenta like that. And then that gives me the spots I'm going to put the white on. My brush does have white in it, so it mixed in with that a little. Now I just go to these spots uh, and focus on the, the upper edges of those spots. So that creates that real purple reflection. But now if I go with pure white, just pure white right on top of those. Is going Are to you just saying that looks like bioluminescence? With all the colors? Oh, man. Yeah. I saw some bioluminescence when we were in Florida. That is a fascinating thing. I have not seen a lot the, of that. You know, it's amazing. David Ross is asking, do you ever do prints of your stuff? No, because I never finish. I never finish uh -oh. anything. We're getting, uh -oh. we're getting into the uh, weaknesses of me as a person now. I don't know how to finish things. That's why I'm doing this, actually. I I, uh, I just looked at this for long enough on the wall, and I said, it is time for me to just dedicate time, get that to where I can call it finished, and put it up for sale. I'm going to sell this sucker. So this is the first, hopefully, of many that I'm going to actually put online for sale. So, So if you're interested, send me an email. I don't have a price set. <laughs> I don't have that. So I'm putting reflection on here, and I'm I'm putting uh, I I'm gonna blend all the top edges of any of these reflection spots I did, so that it really looks like that swooping effect there. And then I'm I'm keeping it kind of messy because I I don't know exactly what shape I want. I'm just waiting for something to take shape. Look good. But look how I left it dark right here. I like what that does for the shape because I want it to look like like there's kind of a sudden uh, wall of, of water getting jarred this way. So I put reflection here, but then I tapered off and I left this dark area before it gets down to here where the next area of reflection is. So here is more level water. See right there, so I, I just like that effect. So you can play with it wherever you put the dark. That's facing up toward you. I talk about it all the time, but I might as well again since we're painting it. So I can create that shape. Maybe try some different things, pile it up. Just like that. That's kind of fun. Maybe there's more fire over here off the side. You know, it doesn't really matter. If the color looks good, it looks good. So I'm trying to steer away from being overly overly technical overly analytical about exactly what's going on as long as it sends the imagination running to interesting places you know that's the goal all right another splash i'm gonna put i'm gonna put a heavy bead of water we're just gonna barely get close to the canvas and my hand's shaky so it'll probably help me do a lot of little little things we're gonna go up here Move down here, do some larger shapes, some smaller shapes, like this, and just really try to make it connect to any shapes that are, it's kind of like when I was doing sea foam, you know, I've got these shapes coming up from the wave, and I want those to be pointing at something, you know, the water gets pulled one direction, goes to something, so when that, when that splashes up, I want those to have these believable places they point to. Okay, so let me know if there's any other part of this painting that I should work on. I did want to show you that technique on the scales. So maybe that'll be the last thing that I mess with here. Is the Yeah, uh, we've got some pictures to look at too. Okay, I'm going to finish this and then see. You got them ready? You got them ready or I we mean, need, a, need a minute? Yeah, you know, they're ready whenever you are. Okay, we've, got okay, a, okay. we've got everything from uh, some train graffiti to... Uh, 
Nice. Not every day. Let's see. Uh, portrait oh, yeah. I always admire that ability. That's that is tough stuff. Okay. And a uh, cute dog. So you know. Nice. Okay, I'm gonna put some of my wave colors in the white water, just like I did. I won't burn up all our time on the live show doing doing tiny details that I've already done other times. But well, do you uh, do you find sometimes kick you storm asks uh, that you can't complete something and you have to come back to it or paint over it? Uh, that has happened. You know, like I have had some projects flop on me where I just lost all reason to continue. It just like the reason for doing it in the first place was gone. I stopped liking the idea. That happens. What are you going to do? You know, you chalk it up as practice. <laughs> it's it's something that happens. So, yeah. So then I just paint over an old picture. Some of some of my coolest paintings that that people like to talk about are over the top of those paintings. <laughs> So there's paintings under paintings. You know what's funny is is uh, I, I had a client once and they had some painting and they, and they said, you know, under that painting is another painting. We took it into the the people at the framing store and they said we can see that there's another painting under here. It might really be worth a lot if you want us to use some chemicals and uh, uncover it. You really might have something valuable. They chose not to do that for risk of not having the the uh, painting that they bought, you know, they were like, well, no, because if it's something terrible, we don't want to just throw away our painting. And so I was thinking how funny that would be in the future if someone, if someone got one of my paintings and said, oh, there's a painting under it. Let's see. <laughs> destroy the good one for one that's like just a partially finished piece of junk. Okay. Anyway, putting little splashes here combinations of long traveling lines with little specks you know maybe i could do some of those flicks on there see, i like these you can see that i i really like to do large sections and on those large sections i'll i'll make just understanding that water pulls and stretches like almost like a bubble gum in fast motion and so it's important for me to include some some slightly lighter highlights on bottom edges because those bottom edges bounce the light back up through. So when you have the longer, smoother traveling lines in combination to the separate isolated, this is a tiny shape, but the reason I do these is because these are accent areas that eyes are gonna be magnetized toward. So, you know, they're worth doing. So in combination with all the little specks, so this is not, you know, I. I think that you could look at this and see a lot more just free chaotic work when, when actually a lot of this is very intentional manipulation of shapes to try to get the look, the nature of water. And I'm, I'm constantly trying to teach that and identify how it pulls and stretches, leaves flat areas. So the combining those more flowing shapes with the specs. Anyway, enough said about that. Let's check out this artwork. I mean, so if you want to take a break from the fire and the disaster. Yeah. The... Let's see something cute. Nice. Yeah, oh, this yeah. comes from Monique. She's got this dog that she says. Uh, Beautiful reflection on the eyes. I love not a monster, Not a monster, but uh, a painting of her friend's dog. Beautiful work. I like that. Good job. You know, just a fun little side note. I, one of these days I'm going to do like a video for kids, how to draw cats, dogs, horses, you know, maybe a dinosaur. And the difference between, you know what a big main difference is between dogs, dogs and cats? Or maybe we did this when we difference. did eyes. Dogs and cats. Dogs have eyes further apart than cats. That's a big difference. So, you know, what? if you end up painting a dog and it looks a little bit like a cat, make the eyes further apart and make the nose more square. I'm just saying those differences can really pay off. You know, <laughs> that's awesome. That's a great looking dog. It's very cute. Nice uh, job with the... Uh, reflection on the black fur that's that's kind of the stuff we're talking about now getting details in the dark shadows Very yeah good. we're gonna we're gonna further keep the mood a little bit lighter here uh yeah okay we got that. the chaos of that yeah this is from epitome hawk this one oh, okay nice look at that all right 
It's work. I like not how you put it. Thank you not for putting yet, the photo reference say, in there. But I uh, just wanted to show you the eye. Okay, and, and very using good. Using your lesson. Awesome. Nice work. And so you're being so mind, the upper, mindful of the a lot of The upper left parts. is the painting that they're working from, and the upper yeah. right is what they'd done before they narrowed the face and painted the yeah. eyes. Yeah. Oh, after okay, watching okay. Your awesome, awesome work. No, no specific questions on this. Just showing the progress. I mean, look how awesome your stuff helped yeah. them paint, you know? Dude, that's, that's rad. Thank you for showing that. Epitome Hawk, beautiful work. I love it. By the way, uh, just, just, uh, just to let you know, uh, uh, Epitome Hawk, that we got Shane and Emily out here, and I, I met them and introduced myself. We had a good time. You know, to, I got to meet Epitome Hawk when I went over close to her hometown. And so we talked about common what? friends that are over here. <laughs> over here in Black. So I won't go on and on on the live show, but it's just a fun connection. We actually got to meet in person. So that's fun. So here is one that we've got. Uh... Oh, we got this more. Kind of wraps, yeah, this kind of wraps Check around the corner here. Thank you guys for sending in your work. This is so fun. Whoa, look at that. Nice. I'd like to be in that room. That's a great, you know what that place is for? That's for sipping on a good hot coffee. Yeah, that's, that's what Jackie. I want to look at. Yeah, nice. Their first yeah. decent mural, they say. They had to cover up broken walls in their old home. Okay, okay, just nice just work. Boost. More than just decent. That is That is beautiful. Nice job. Love then, the shadows. Uh, Love the shadows and highlights on the shadows. The white with that blue kind of shadow. Awesome. And then uh, Frank Rigatoni. You know, I'm. I'm. I don't know where this came from or uh, who painted this. I'm not associated with it in any way. Yeah. Okay. Let's check it but, out. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Whoa! Nice three dimensional art. I like that. Just sending in yeah. some look. Wow. So man. this is this is something that they were working on, but so what they're asking is that uh that gold kind of structure in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful right? so work. That, I love that. that. I just have to say that turquoise glow is phenomenal. Awesome. Yeah, work. so that they that turquoise glow, they're wondering if they should incorporate that turquoise glow. Yeah, okay. Into, I lost the end of their into their background, which is there we this go. There guy we go. right here. Beautiful, yeah. Well, so like I can't tell you or something. They want to get their background shaped up on this. Thing. I got you. I got you. Okay, look, this is what you do. Just do it on the edges. Incorporate it on the very edges. Just like, just like in my painting, I'm imagining where the edges wrap around. So on your silos that wrap around, just on those edges, put a very dull, darker version of that or grayer. It's 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 like the halfway between your gray silo and the light you're bouncing off of. I do think that's an excellent question and a very good thing to do. You can blend those into your background. I think it'd look awesome if you put a little bit of that turquoise on the very edges of those silos, but not on the middle because that's facing right toward us, you know, in, the, in what'll give it that nice backlit three-dimensional look is having it just on those edges. So it looks like the light's coming and bouncing off as it, as it comes toward us. And then that in combination with your yellow will look awesome. I'm just telling you right now that will look awesome when it when you have those edges with the turquoise next to that yellow. I can see that That's being super pretty cool. awesome aurora borealis. Yeah, man, that is great. Your your use yeah. of bright white inside of the colorful green inside of the blue has accomplished a very illuminated look. Nice job with that that uh, complex color and brightness gradient as. All right, so just Top the last notch. call, everybody. Send your stuff to info at muraljoe.com. You know what's awesome? For about an hour and 20, so... We're Look at this background. Ben, just keep looking handsome. The background on Ben okay. is just like... This is what we just saw. That So that last art... I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the last art. <laughs> you look good, Ben. <laughs> look at this. It's the same thing. So you look what an excellent job you did. We have the same thing. The bluest color, the turquoise color, and then the white inside of it. You accomplished a very, yeah, very nice yeah. photograph. There's an example. Well, we maybe, and that's a photograph. Cut back, cut back to the other one, right? We don't need to just be looking. Yeah. yeah, right. We don't need to. Okay, okay. So uh, back to the back yeah. to the awesome. Thing awesome. Here. Okay. So send in send in anything. Uh, or, or ask any questions about this painting. You know what? I'm going to start painting the scales. What, where are we going to? Right, I'm going to start painting scales. So we'll get Brian to really zoom in here on the 
on the uh, details of this guy. So it's just because, just for those of you that come across this video and you're like, how do I paint scales on a dragon? <laughs> Pretty specific thing, but I was really excited when I found this. So I'm starting with just black because I'm, I'm going for high contrast. I'm going for shapes that pop. And you saw me in the time lapse doing a lot of trial and error on where to make these lines go. So I'm making it come around the back. You know, it goes around the back of my beast right here. And then it comes down and changes direction as it wraps under. That direction changes to make it wrap under this. So I get it. If I do that with both lines, and, and this was a result of trial and error. You know, you keep drawing rings around something in, in a drawing and then you paint it, and then you erase it and then you try again and you erase it try it again you're bound to land on something that you you're going to end up learning what gives you the three-dimensional shape you like but you know i just thought through it i i just thought through okay if i had the the i have one a cross section like this because i do want scales that are in a like a star pattern from the neck because this is a natural pattern on reptiles you get scales coming out from the base of the neck down the shoulders and and I imagine that being good for aerodynamics. You know, you don't when when a, when an animal reaches, just like when we bend our arm, reach our arm, hair grows in particular ways to make that all much nicer of an experience for us. It would be an annoying experience if you are always uh, moving and reaching against the grains of the things that grow off your body. So it's really something to appreciate and admire about bodies is the the directions things are placed to make it all not not just functional but comfortable and so i'm going to complete these shapes we'll take this one here and zoop like that zoop, zoop zoop and then and then when i do that i can always come back to redo this stuff i i didn't follow a particular pattern when it gets to the chest and the belly like they're just scattered alligator kind of squares you know, so when it gets here, this is where I really want the pattern. And I'll have to get rid of these right yeah, here. Those your, are... your epitome says you're really capturing the silver look, you know, the metallic. Oh, thank look. you very much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you exactly how that, how my strategy for trying to get that look. Uh, some of the scales were done with a, with a black and white, while others I started adding in that, that blue purple color to. And so the contrast of those two things was the way i intended to try to get that effect so let's do it right here watch so we want scales so here's the trick you go to these crisscross patterns that you made we're going to mix a color and i'm going to make uh the i'm going to work on these upper upper facing so i need more of a, a gray violet again for those because this is capturing the, the light coming from the sky all that blue light coming from the sky and my creature i'm imagining naturally being some shade of gray so it doesn't have a lot of color to contribute to the mix so now i'm going to add a little bit of white. i'm just getting my my scale color right here so we're going to get some of this and let's do a test let's see what that looks like okay i like that look i like that color i'm just going to leave it just like that and so here's where you put the stroke this is the brush right can everybody see the point of the brush right here so the point let me put it against some light color so you can see it's this way now i'm going to push toward the point with the brush laid not all the way sideways but partly sideways that motion is going to give me a shape i'm just going to do it right here so you can really see the shape look at this shape light pressure increase pressure decrease pressure release see that shape that's a scale so that stroke right there it, this is kind of a fun illusion look how dark that color is and then when i go down here that color is not dark not nearly as dark it, it matches these it, this looks darker than the body of this doesn't it so anyway here let's lighten it just a little bit i'm seeing that it is just a bit dark so before i can where did i put that so that's the technique i just want you to see that technique so we go in here after i lighten this color a little bit <clears throat> I want it to overlap the side of the diamond that is pointing where the direction the scale is growing. So the, the point, the end of the scale, that is on top. So look at this. See that overlap? Just barely overlapping. I went slow so you could see how I did that. I'm going to do it again. 
I'm going to do it on the one up that is overlapping it. Now I start at the corner and I go, I go ahead and cover up some of that diamond. See how it covered it up? So when I do this over and over, this resulting pattern, I'm going to do it a little bit quicker. Now we're going to go here. We're going to go here. So you can quickly go through after you make your diamond. Okay, so do you see how that section has taken on a different texture? Now it doesn't just look like cross-hatched diamonds. So let's lighten it up a little bit like this. We can come back again here. Wait, let's, let's do a few more of them. Do a few more of them. So here. Paige says, this is seriously amazing how it's turning out. Thank you so much. I really Seriously. Love <laughs> Thank you, Paige. That's a very nice compliment. I appreciate you saying that. I am saying that it kind of looks like your Leviathan is wearing fishnet. Yeah, it, it does look you like got, that. You moment. got a saucy Leviathan <laughs> yeah. going here, yeah. Mr. Mural Joe. That's it. That's it. Okay. Out ready for a eventful Saturday night. So, once you get these in overlapping the in this case the left side but i just want you to i want to emphasize that it's the it's the side where it's growing toward and so you overlap the line a little bit on that side and it creates the overlapped look of the scales then you come back you don't lose track of them see because once you have these little brush strokes it it actually is fascinating just how easy it is to see even when you obstruct your lines you still see those really well and so now i'm going to put a, a bright highlight same color just adding white maybe a little blue or i don't know here let's just make it lighter so this is going to be like the bright moonlight uh the reflection of these bright clouds in here and i'm just going to pick areas just like on on this neck here areas that i imagine if the light bounced like a ping pong ball it would come toward me so i'm imagining it coming hitting this shoulder and chunk, bouncing like that Right toward me on this one. Smaller shapes inside of the bigger shapes, but the same shape brush stroke. And that right there makes these scales have a rounded. Now I did water it down. There was a question earlier about changing the texture of the paint to accomplish the technique. So I watered this down a bit. I added water out of my bucket to just to this little patch. I just add a little water and so now we go inside there inside there you can see some of my black lines have disappeared but that's okay because i have the contrast of my colors so now what used to be fishnet is now the negative space it's the shadow in between the scales that are so tightly sealed that no air can pass between them that's that is the words of the author of this the description of this creature that I based the painting off of. Hey, Sora Link over there in Germany. It's 1 a.m. They're getting sleepy. Thanks for tuning in. Oh, out. thank you very much for watching, man. That was really good of you to tune in as long as you did. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to go like this. To get that silvery look, we're going to go black and white. I'll just add it to the same color, black and white. So now the color is getting browner, you see? So it's going to look brown just in comparison. It looks more brown. So now I'll use that where it's facing toward me, where I don't want it doing as much reflection of the sky. So we'll go like this right here. See how it's just a stroke right there that creates that. And I'm going to stop when it gets down into the darker colors because I've got a mix of darker color right there. But having this saves me so much time when every scale is just a single stroke. I was so excited when I found this because I really wanted lifelike scales. I didn't want to just do, like on many paintings of reptiles, just an impression of a scaly texture. That, that was kind of like, uh, just, I didn't want to do that. I wanted it, I was like, man, I really want the real look. The scales are so much. When you see, when you see something that is, has tight patterns and it's very machine-like and organized it becomes more intimidating because of that it looks like something that is built and designed and in this case designed to be the apex predator you fear and it's just something about that pattern adds to the intimidation factor you know okay so now 
I'm going to use a darker color. I don't need the I don't need the reflection in there anymore. Now I want just the darker color. So we're going to go blue. What I meant was I don't need that lightest color because this is facing right toward me. All I want is a darker bluer color now because maybe the light that's coming toward this is bouncing off that water. I do want some fire color. Really that that this is a great place to have some of that fire color. So I might I might change my mind a little, but this is far away. I changed my mind. It's far away, so we're not going to do that. So we'll go like this now. Oh, we're going to go a little bit lighter. So look, I've got colors on my palette still in between those because it was a, a bit of an extreme change. So we'll get this, and we'll do the next row down with this color. And maybe I'll just do some little, little taps on the lower portions of the scales above it to create a dark reflection rather than a light reflection. A reflection doesn't always have to be a bright spot on something. It can be a dark spot on something. So if I put it on the lower half of each scale, then I've got a dark reflection. Okay, so then I'll get a little bit darker still. And I'll go down here and... i got to think of a new word to um, say when I make brush strokes. You know, uh, is Joop already taken or something? Well, I've just said it a lot. I feel like I'm starting to burn it out. But I need a sound uh, effect. Maybe I could change it to the zoom. Or yeah, zoom. I mean, honestly, if you were over here going like pew pew pew, like I think that'd probably be really irritating. Oh, like, well, this is like his gimmick. What is this guy? Like, he's really talented, but yeah. he's sounds. trying to he's trying too hard with the performance thing and the sound. Yeah, I mean, the sound you make is like a dance move. You know, you just gotta feel the flow. And you just gotta yeah, let it take for some over reason you. That, yeah that for Pos some reason possess like, your your body your mouth whatever it needs to do just you know so, get in there so, it's it's what makes me feel you know it's like uh, it's like it's like whistle in as you work it keeps my energy level up when I make the little sound effects nice we got people from Trinidad over here watching you Sweet. make sound effects on the internet dude. hey all right cool. Cool. Thank and, you for watching. Uh, all the Lubeck, way Lubeck as well, wherever that is. I'm gonna have to look on the map over there. I'm gonna have to look on the map for that one. Yeah, but yeah. we need to uh, get that map going to to put a pin where all you you folks chime in from. You're right. We do uh, have a world map. Last last call, everybody. It's been about an hour and a half of yeah. Uh, we gotta wrap it dragon up. Dragon action. We're gonna wrap it up soon. Uh, send anything gotta you wrap want. It up. That's a little bit. To show Joe to info at mealjoe.com. So you can see the paint is getting darker as it dries. That's something I want to paint out. Uh, paint out. Point out. I want to point out that the paint is getting darker as it dries, and that is causing more of a reflective kind of steely, refl uh, steely shiny look. You know, Mavis is saying, what's the source <clears throat> of a dark reflection? Oh, well, think of everything as a mirror where it's just a dark object. And the only reason it shows up is because there's brighter things around it. And so... Yeah, if it was just if everything was just in the dark and we're not seeing, obviously you don't see that. But it's a dark reflection is just an easy way for me to think about the mirror image of the shadows. So everything is essentially like a mirror. It's just a matter of how good the mirror is. Some mirrors are really dirty and colored. Like if you just put a whole bunch of I'm just touching up that that little spot. You know, I didn't want that little spot. <laughs> Some mirrors are are dirty with other colors and so they show them some mirrors are uh, really highly reflective like a piece of steel but still even a piece of steel is not exactly like a mirror because whatever it, it'll still have some gray to it so so every mirror has some level of influence on the reflection and so the most perfect mirrors are the closest to zero influence on, on the colors of the reflections and and so something like these scales think of it as a mirror that has a very high level of obstruction to the image that's reflecting but everything 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 is a mirror it all bounces the light it's just a matter of how much it chops it up and sends it different directions that's the sharpness of the edges in that reflection is how much it bounces it in other directions when it comes 
So I'm going to continue working on this, doing all these things. You know, I didn't, I didn't get to doing any of the glowing uh, fires, this, but you will see, you can go to my how to paint fire video and see more on this. There's actually a lot of videos. This was fun. I'm going to call it right there. I'm going to stop just, just for today. I'm going to finish this. I'm going to post it. I think I'm just another week away and it'll be done. Oh, I want to Let's do check out this. Uh, I forgot to do the rock. You want to do hey, what? Uh, let me show you this real <clears throat> Five minutes. Let's do. Let's do, or just two minutes. Let's do two minutes on these. I really want. Anybody out there got two minutes? Does anybody got All two right. minutes? Does anybody? Some, <laughs> somebody in the Netherlands, I think, has two minutes. Yeah, okay. Okay. I forgot. I, this was something I added. This was not in the time lapse video. We just. I added this, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna leave some of that blank to show the difference this makes. So this was just dark shadow, and so you can back up in the video and see the time lapse of before this was. And so I want to show you how to get these three-dimensional shapes with hardly any colors. Look, you're just going red and blue make a very dark, that's all it is, red, blue, and black, and white, red, blue, black, and white. You can make uh, all kinds of cool stuff with red, blue, black, and white. But I go to my reddest area, and that's where I'm going to put my highlights. And when the white hits it, it changes that red violet into a much less red violet. You know, very interesting, very interesting thing that happens. But the red goes away, turns into this nice, subtle violet. And then I've got these highlights. I'm going to highlight them just a bit more and I'll do a few of them. And I'm, I'm spacing them apart and I'm going to make little shapes, big shapes. I'm, I'm just making shapes that get darker as they go down because I want it to look like these, these rocky crags. A word I learned from my good friend, Mary, when she was at the workshop, I said, what are crags anyway? <laughs> so she showed me some craggy cliffs so i'm making some craggy cliffs in this and so pure black that's pure black right there just in the deepest spots and like we've talked about why would i not use pure black of course i'm going to use pure black i want that to pop i want the contrast so i'm just going to put pure black wherever i want my i put blue so that these are more blue these are more red i'm going to try to balance those a little more make them more similar just with the touch more blue and then I'm going to bring these colors up to the black, but without, without going all the way over the black. So little bits of that darkest shadow are left, and that gives me these little crevices that are in between these shapes. And it was very fun. It was just a fun thing to build this cliffside with, with those. You know, and then maybe in here, I just it's just white. This is all this is. It's just white. And I can make a little ledge facing up toward the sky when it mixes with those wet colors. I just put lines going this way, like this. Then look, we've got a, we've got some angles that are pointing up now. See, when I when I do rocks, it's not zoop because that's they're not they don't have that organic feel. It's like it's like the geometric hard edges, so they need a more of a hard sound. Like I'm realizing that I really do I really do think of it that way, digging into the deep psychological reasons i do quirky things well you know it's funny you say that because uh mac That's mac Dieter, show you. mac <laughs> Dieter, two three five five eight yeah. says, okay uh, nice nice good job on when that. watching the bomb gartner channel they find that they're always amazed how meticulous artists in former times worked and here they are now watching an artist working this meticulous okay cool yeah so kind of noticing you know like uh how uh developed and analytical and meticulous and yeah that's it you know because well and just it's just my line of work it's just my line of work uh in my work i'm always on a mission to accomplish a very particular goal while some artists are going to uh, see just see where the road leads and then maybe do an awesome job of marketing and selling whatever comes out but uh, i'm not criticizing that or challenge i think that's fun and fantastic but but my uh position has led me my job has led me down more of a researcher's path because the mission is very specific i some a client will say to me i want a picture that looks just like this can you do this they're not looking for my personal expression you know where other pieces of art they are looking for that. So it just depends on your on your purposes. But I I personally love the mission 
and gaining control or over the, the picture, gaining control to just build it gradually. That's it. I'm going to stop there. We're going to take a look at any last things. Do we got anything on there, Ben? That's uh, yeah, yep. So uh, we got some people scrambling there in the chat. Pull up the chair. Pull up the, the chair. Pipeline, but uh, in the meantime, oh, I'm feeling my age. This, I'm feeling my age when one. I sit down. <laughs> okay. Well, let me show you a pretty picture to take a little nice. Take okay. a load off of your old. Oh, one. that is beautiful. Nice work. Yeah. I love that. So we got one from Chris here. This is Chris doing their thing. Awesome work. I love the use of the dark colors. Black, if that's pure black, I just want to say nice work. Uh, on the, In between the foliage. But then on the other hand, I also just want to suggest, just a suggestion, that maybe you could put a little more of the gray violet blue look on the clouds where you've got the dark gray on the clouds. Maybe that, that bluish uh, color would be nice to send these clouds further up into the sky. The shapes and the height and the scale of these looks just fantastic. Just fantastic. And I love your ways and the foreground. They Beautiful. sent you over a couple of them here. We'll, uh, we'll, uh, okay, we got to see yeah, it. Uh, see option it. number two here. This is what else they've been up to. So they watched your, uh, your content and then this is what they. No way. I don't deserve reading. that much credit. Come on. This is awesome. Wow. Yeah, they've been uh, for the last year or so. That they is use cool. Your techniques and color theory, they say. Thank you so much for pointing that out. Color theory is such a big deal to me. You know, I, I really think it through and I and I just believe that it will give anybody anybody who values it and really thinks about this the same payoff. You know, thank you for saying that. That really encourages me. This is beautiful. I love that. I love your I love your gray silhouette clouds in front of the saturated clouds that is a good look in the fog in the valley or the awesome you got some good effects in there that's neat and then Thank we you. got uh one more here from chris this is i saved you this one for last because i kind of yeah kind of dig here so that galaxy is, scene behind you that's something i like that uh you know i i think you might have painted Whoa. That is this the same artist this is the same artist, man. This is Chris. This is the color theory that you've oh, given them. Now that one just really, just because the reflection, I immediately saw the reflection. That's where my eyes just glued to it, like reflection. Whoa. Nice work. I, I, just, I just am blown away. The quality, that's astounding. You've got a very subtle gradient that tells you right away that that lower part is reflection it's slightly darker as if the water's deep and darkening the source color and you've got the difference between like the gold illuminated those those look very much like smoke clouds it's awesome awesome i love that so cool thanks for sharing that art man that is maybe more detail than i even have the patience to put into a painting i love that yeah man i feel like i'm gonna see a, a <laughs> yeah. brontosaurus head or something pop up out of there oh perhaps. that'd be cool yeah beautiful work yeah that's great all right man uh we yeah. uh have reached the bottom of the barrel on this one so oh, okay sweet man thank you everybody for uh sending in your work i think that is like the best part of these shows we're gonna do this again next week 3 30 p.m mountain standard time and these videos are recorded and will be archived at muraljoe.com we had how to draw eyes we had how to paint eyes those are no longer uh getting high views on youtube it's like we're gonna put these for people that really want to learn from these videos those are put on the website for subscribers and that's the future of this video as well just in case you're wondering it'll spend a little bit of time here being free and then it'll be on muraljoe.com and so uh, I love it when you subscribe. And if anybody ever donates on my website, there is a donation button. I'm not asking you to donate. I'm just thrilled that you're here. But if anyone ever does, I want you to know I'm going to give, I'm going to split that three ways between Brian and Ben and me because they volunteer their time. <laughs> and so they're good guys for doing that. I make it possible. And uh, you also are helping make this possible. So that's all I want to say. Just a big thanks. And we'll see you next time. Okay, microphones are off. Let's go over here and end the stream.
and 